Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Weeknights with Wonder Girls. I'm Mabel. And I'm Cheryl. Today is indeed a cooling off day before a very <laughs> exciting TGIF tomorrow. Yes. Perfect day to learn about Iceland, don't you think so? <laughs> indeed, indeed, I agree. Yeah. This evening, our guest presenter from Iceland, Renato, will be sharing all about the lovely places to visit in Iceland. To our audience, have you been to Iceland before? Or perhaps it is in your travel list, your travel bucket list. If your answer is yes to both, type ICE, I-C-E in the comments to let us know. Also, please like and share this broadcast. Before we start, allow me to share a little bit about ourselves if you are new to Travel Wonder. Travel Wonder is a licensed online and offline travel company based in Singapore, and we specialize in active holidays. Join us in future if you're looking for cycling, hiking, or running holidays overseas. We are also good in bespoke travel. We can plan all sorts of vacations that you desire, such as romantic getaways, rest and relaxation trips, or even family fun trips according to your requirement. Our website mm -hmm. is www.travel-wonder.com. So remember to check us out when you're ready to travel. Yes. Keep the engagement up and give us a like and share this video and comment away. Tonight, we'll be giving away a world travel adapter to the highest engager. Please join us to welcome Renato from Iceland. All right. Hi, Hello. Renato. We should Hello. say good afternoon to you. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it's a lovely afternoon in Iceland. It's a cool 12 degrees, and that is summer heat in our country. Wow. But we, instead, we have 24 hours of daylight, so we do not sleep. Wow, I'm going really? To learn from you later on how you do not sleep. <laughs> That's right. So I assume yeah. it's probably very hot in Singapore. So it might be good for you to have like an air conditioned presentation about Iceland <laughs> because we we feel that we are a fully air conditioned country. So probably nice for you the next one and a half hours. Definitely. We are looking forward to that. Yes, actually, in fact, uh, these two months, June and July, we have a little bit of a strange weather. It's uh, mm -hmm. raining the whole day today, so it's really very cool. And the month of June, we are also experiencing a lot of rainfall, which is quite unusual. True. That's, that's the opposite in Iceland. We actually had hardly any rain in mm -hmm. uh, May, June, and also now in July. So maybe soon we might have a dry season in our country. <laughs> Okay. But it's summertime, so it is drier in summer. Yeah. And then okay. we already have some of our regular uh, viewers online. We have Austina. We have Wayid. We have Stuart also, too. Stuart, uh, yes. yeah. They have been they have been very supportive of our virtual destination feature every other week. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Let me also tell you that Singapore is one of my favorite places to go. Um, being in Iceland, I'm used to living in a country with a small population, and Reykjavik is also a small town. If mm -hmm. I ever, if I ever, ever forced to live in a big city, Singapore will definitely be on my bucket list to emigrate if I'm banned. <laughs> to live in Iceland. And a few times I came to Singapore and of course I go to Marina Bay to look at the mm. laser show. And sometimes the laser show is so amazing, it reminds me to the northern lights in Iceland. So when you have a lot of green up in the sky, it could be a good inspiration for northern lights, Aurora. <laughs> Don't you find our country too hot? Yes, it is. But you have a lot of really good um, air conditioning, especially in the shopping malls. <laughs> <laughs> so what I learned is in, in Singapore, if you want to cool down, you go inside or indoors. In Iceland, it's opposite. If you want to cool down, you go outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice to know. That's interesting to know, in fact. Yes. To our viewers, please continue to give us many likes, comment, and share the broadcast. If you have any questions about Iceland, feel free to put them in the comment, and we will respond later during the Q&A session. Remember, we have a world travel adapter to be given away tonight. So now I think it's time for us to hand it over so that I can take a back seat and enjoy the presentation. Yes. 
But before Renato uh, takes over the presentation, just have a couple of slides to share with everybody. Okay, just a reminder to everybody, our website is www.travel-wonder.com. So you can go to our website to look at all the active leisure holidays we have planned out. For our trips to Iceland, where can you find them? You can find them on our website, search under Destination Iceland. Please subscribe to our mailing list if you are not. We send our new e-newsletter out every Friday to keep everybody abreast on what we are what is up and coming at Travel Wonder. You can also view all our past trip photos and videos on our social media platform on Facebook and YouTube. All right, so let's say welcome to Iceland. My name is Renato. If that is too difficult, you can call me the Iceman. I represent a travel agency in Iceland that exists since 1931, a family company, and we are specialized, of course, into group tours in Iceland. Let's start first with the not so pleasant uh, meet, uh, news, which probably token everywhere all the time. It's COVID. The situation in Iceland is pretty good. So we had in our country so far 1,866 cases, 10 deaths, and right now are 16 people in isolation, no one in hospital. So in general, we have an extensive testing, good healthcare, and we opened our borders for Schengen, European Union, and 14 other countries on June 15th. So we do start getting some tourists which have the option of doing doing a COVID test at the airport. Uh, they get a result after five hours, and if they're negative, they can freely enjoy our country. Or option B would be going 14 days into quarantine, which probably no one will choose except maybe Icelandic people coming home. And everybody will have to download the COVID app so we can trace them if needed. Regarding the COVID situation and for future travel, we of course look at Iceland as a low risk area, one of the safest places in the world. The main reason for that is simply we have no crowds in our country, a lot of wide open spaces. So it becomes natural to have um, a, a distance between people so it's actually very hard to have a lot of people together in one spot so it's a lot of space or enough space for everybody people coming to iceland especially after covid is i guess a lot of people want to reconnect with nature want to get fresh air pure water and a deep quiet it is a high hygiene standard. It's a clean country and a safe country, and everything is very small. So we don't have really big hotels, no big attractions, no big restaurants. So it's very easy to just be a few people together. And in general, the way how Iceland handled the pandemic is very reassuring for people to come. And so there's a lot of trust into visiting Iceland. Not talking about COVID is really talking now about Iceland. So you see a map in front of you and the red island is Iceland located in between Europe and North America. Coming from Singapore, it will either be two flights or three flights, depending on the routing you take. So if you fly directly from Singapore to Europe, then you just have a connecting flight from Europe to Iceland. To give you an idea, London is two and a half hours flight, Central Europe is three hours, and Scandinavia can be anywhere from two and a half to three and a half hours flight. If you travel via Middle East, that would be three flights, so via Middle East to Europe, and then again a connecting flight from Europe to Iceland. Even if you would travel to Scandinavia, you still have to take a flight. So if you travel or combine Scandinavia with Iceland, it will be two and a half hours from Norway and three and a half hours from Finland uh, to get to Iceland. One problem we have in our country is the name, and that also is valid for our neighbor Greenland. As you can see on the map, the big island Greenland is actually not very green. It's actually 80% ice. So Greenland should be Iceland, while the small neighbor Iceland is actually very green. So Iceland should actually be called Greenland. But here we go, we have the wrong name, and we have to explain all the time why, that Iceland is not ice cold. 
Iceland is about the same size as South Korea. While in South Korea live 50 million people, in Iceland live only 360,000 people. So it's a very small population on a big land. 65% of the population lives in the capital city of Reykjavik. And four-fifths of the country cannot even be populated. That's again says when you come after COVID, it's easy to be the only person in a spot in our country. So who lives in Iceland? It's a 100,000 horses, 360,000 people, and actually 700,000 sheep. So the double amount of sheep than people. When you wonder how long does it take to see Iceland, so if you want to actually do a round trip, traveling on our main road around Iceland, connecting the different villages and towns along the coast, it's actually around the 2,000 kilometers of driving, which means it's eight days or longer. So if you really want to see the most of Iceland, you will have to give it eight days or longer. Now, should you not have eight days of time or let's say not the budget for eight days, you might just maybe combine Iceland with another European destination or you travel for any other reason to Europe and say, oh, we're so nearby, let's go to Iceland. And you might stay only two, three, four, five nights. You might just choose staying in Reykjavik, the capital city. That's the red dot on the map. The international airport called Keflavik is the yellow dot on the map and it's 45 minutes between the airport and the city. Now, if you stay all the nights in Reykjavik only, that means you can only see whatever is in the blue circle on the map because that is where which you can reach uh, easily in form of a day excursion or day tour out of the capital. So leaving in the morning and coming back in the evening to stay all the nights in the city. Even so, you travel only within that blue circle on the map, you still see everything that Iceland is famous for, meaning you will see the Blue Lagoon, you will see fjords, you will see volcanoes, hot springs and lava fields, you will see waterfalls, glaciers, you can even go whale watching and definitely you will see within that blue circle the midnight sun and the northern lights. But if you want to see more of Iceland, then you should just stay longer, move to another overnight location and probably stay one week or longer to circle all of the island. Now, what is the best time to visit Iceland? We have two main seasons. Summer, which is right now, so we consider summer June to August. That is the time when we have up to 24 hours of daylight. We actually have two months in the summer, roughly from the 20th of May to 20th of July, with zero darkness. So if you can sleep, that's the time you should come because 24 hours of daylight, imagine the energy level it gives to you nature and wildlife. You really don't feel tired. You're very active. It's the time also of the midnight sun. And if you are an outdoor active traveler, it's probably the best time to visit. So if you like hiking, biking, river rafting, kayaking, fishing, whale watching, camping, and many other things, yes, summer in Iceland is the best time. Now, if you are planning to come and see the aurora or the northern lights, that would be in winter. And that is basically the main reason why people travel in the winter to see the aurora from middle of September to middle of April. But I will tell you much more about the aurora later on. So if you ask me what is the best time to visit, I will always tell you summer because summer means our warmest temperatures. Now, yes, when you come from Singapore, probably Iceland will always be cold for you. Or let's just say it, it is fully air conditioned for you. So in summertime we have 12 to 18 degrees and not to forget the 21st of June is the day when the sun does not set. So we don't have a sunrise and a sunset, the sun is always up. So that's the longest day with 24 hours of daylight. 
while the peak surprise is probably the winter time. So the winter, the average temperature is zero degrees. That is very similar to New York, London, or Central Europe. It is much colder in the winter time in Scandinavia, Germany, Switzerland, and definitely Eastern Europe. So you, Iceland is never really hot, but it's also never really freezing cold. So the main difference between summer and winter is maybe not necessarily the temperature, it's the daylight that we have. So 21st of June is 24 hours of daylight, while 21st of December is only five hours of daylight. So going, coming back to the question, what's the best time to visit? I would definitely tell you 21st of June because you have 24 hours to look at our beautiful country. If you come 21st of December, you only get five hours of daylight and that is far too little to see all what Iceland has to offer. So this is how Iceland could look in summer. So it's green, it has flowers, the ocean is blue. We even eat ice cream in summertime. We actually, we eat it all year. And then of course we have the midnight sun, meaning the sun goes down around midnight. So you could actually play golf at midnight. Where else could you do that? Winter is probably looking like that. So you probably expect snow and definitely you want to see the aurora, the ocean light in the sky at night. Now, one thing I need to tell you about the snow, because when you come from Singapore all the way to Iceland in the winter, you probably want to see snow, but there might be a disappointment. Iceland cannot guarantee snow. And I repeat that, Iceland cannot guarantee snow. It might sound silly to you because we're called Iceland. Yes, exactly. We are called Iceland, so we can guarantee you ice because 11% of our country is covered by glaciers. That means ice. We can show you ice and glaciers all year, summer and winter. It's actually easier to see it in the summer than in the winter. We are not called snowland, so we cannot really guarantee you snow. The reason for that is again the temperature. Average temperature is zero degrees in winter time, which means it's not cold enough to guarantee and keep snow. So it has to be more freezing in order to have a lot or always snow. So why do people want to come or are coming to Iceland? You can a little bit compare Iceland to a country like New Zealand, Canada, and Alaska. The reason why you travel to such countries is basically nature, scenery, and landscape. And imagine Iceland as a total different country. Maybe more than that. Maybe imagine it as their own little planet. We have nothing in common with Scandinavia. We have nothing in common with actually Europe or North America. We're just our own little planet there in the mid-Atlantic. It's a volcanic land with almost no vegetation. We probably look more like the moon than any other country in the, on, in the world. Then another reason is outdoor activities. You might remember I told you in the beginning, four-fifths of the country cannot be populated. If you want to get into this wilderness, into these remote areas, the more active you are, the more choices you have. So you have all these outdoor activities to play with the, our nature. And then, of course, the 360,000 peop 360, people, we have our own Viking culture. So yes, horses, Viking farms, and many other things relating us to the Viking culture. What do I mean with nature, scenery, and landscape? First of all, we are volcanic land. So we are a country of volcanoes. Maybe you have gone to Indonesia and Philippines, they have volcanoes too. But those volcanoes and volcanic land is all covered by vegetation. That's the contrary in Iceland. You will see all those volcanoes and we have about 150 active volcanoes. We probably have a volcano eruption every four years, but often they are in areas that are no one living so they don't really affect our daily lives. So we have hot springs, geysers, we have lava fields and black beaches, which you can see very well because they're not covered by vegetation. But most of all, Iceland is a land of waterfalls we probably have about 10,000 waterfalls. So when you look at that Iceland itinerary, there will be always some waterfalls each single day. 
Sometimes people ask, why do I have to look at so many waterfalls in Iceland? Yes, we have 10,000 of them. Now imagine how your trip would look like in India or Thailand, how many temples you have to look at. If you would go to Rome in Italy or you go to Spain, how many churches you have to look at? Yes, in Iceland, we don't have the monuments, we don't have the temples, and we don't have the churches. Instead, we have the waterfalls, the fjords, the glaciers, the mountains, and we have a lot of those. But all these different waterfalls are uniquely beautiful and different. So one waterfall is not the same as the next waterfalls. 11% of the country are, is ice, means glaciers. We have the fjords, so similar like uh, Norway, uh, Alaska, like New Zealand, for example. So the fjord is when the ocean goes inland, surrounded by mountains. We have desert landscape. So it's the only country in Europe who has a desert, but it's not like the Sahara with yellow sand. It's more black, gray rocks and sand, and of course, lava. It is just the biggest wilderness of Europe. We have wide open spaces. Then in the winter, we have the aurora, the northern lights. And in the summer, we have the midnight sun. So that's about our nature. So it kind of, you don't like nature, probably Iceland would not be your place because that's really the main attraction that Iceland has. When we talk about outdoor activities, we might make a difference between really active travel meaning adventure travel and iceland is generally an adventure travel destination again four-fifths of the country is not populated there's no infrastructure meaning it's really a playground for adventure travelers again similar to new zealand for example canada and alaska so what do we play with in iceland with nature we have the glaciers so we can do a glacier walk snowmobile ride, we can visit ice caves, we can do boat trips between floating icebergs. Then we have the hot springs, so we can bathe in and warm up in a geothermal hot spring. Remember that we have 100,000 horses, so you can go horseback riding. So why are the horses important? Because four-fifths of the country is not populated, no infrastructure, that means the horse is the car of Iceland. So if you want to get into this wilderness, the horse is actually the best way to do so. Now, we have this adventure travel, but probably many of you might say, no, I'm not really active. I don't want to have it too wild and dangerous. I'm more into soft adventure. Yes, we do have a lot of choices of physically not demanding activities. Everybody can go on a whale watching and bird watching tour. Everybody can do a boat trip between floating icebergs. It is not difficult to even to walk on a glacier because anyway, it's not about the distance you walk on ice. It's about your Instagram picture you take because you put on your crampons, hold your ice axe, you turn in the direction of the ice and make a picture and show the world in Singapore what a brave Viking you have become. You can go even play golf at midnight. Where else can you do that? So there is several, and also, of course, it's not difficult to go bathing in the Blue Lagoon or any other hot spring. So there's many soft adventure, physically not demanding. But yeah, if you're very active and adventurous person, we are an adventure paradise. Now, when we talk about soft adventure and activities, we have a few very unique experience in Iceland where you can, which you cannot do anywhere else. One thing is you can actually go into a volcano and I'm not talking about going into a crater. I mean, really, you go into the mountain and only five people in one hour can do that. So this is a very exclusive activity. We go down with a basket into the mountain. Just imagine a skyscraper in Singapore with a basket cleaning the windows at that skyscraper. But the moment you take the skyscraper away, you tangle there into the mountain. And hopefully the volcano doesn't erupt and hopefully the basket waits for you to take you out the mountain again. But yeah, it's a dormant volcano, so you don't need to be scared. But this one of, is the only place in the world where you actually can go into a volcano. 
Another option is you can just go into a museum to see liquid lava. There's no other museum in the world who shows you that because they have the possibility to melt lava rocks and make it liquid again. So you can actually go and see liquid lava. Then you can go into ice caves. We have one which we call a man-made ice cave. It's an ice tunnel open all year. So you can go winter or summer. Again, it's not physically demanding. A truck brings you to the entrance of the ice cave and you just dress the same way as you dressed anywhere in Iceland when you're outdoors to go into the ice cave. Because the good thing about being inside the ice cave, it's not windy. It might be a little bit cold, but definitely not windy. So it's actually enjoyable. But you can also go into a natural ice cave. We call them crystal ice caves or blue ice caves. Those ice caves are usually only safe to enter from November to March because they need to be solid frozen in order to enter. So the man-made one is safe all year, but while the natural ones, they're actually formed or created during the summer when the ice is melting on the glaciers, but then they're only safe to enter when it gets cold and they start freezing. This is a big Instagram location and many people in Singapore really love to go to the crystal ice caves, but just be aware they are only safe to enter November to March. And even during that time, sometimes they will be closed because there is global warming, even in Iceland. So if it's suddenly getting too warm, those ice uh, caves might melt or could even collapse. But the same is when it's raining in the winter time, the rainwater will go into the crevasses and coming out through those lava caves. So you might have a river coming out of the lava, uh, no, sorry, out of the ice cave, meaning that you could not enter. Just be aware of that. But it's a big attraction, especially for the market from Singapore. Then another thing is, of course, we in Iceland love to go bathing. Now in Singapore, when it's hot, you probably go to swim to cool down. But in Iceland, it's opposite. We go to bathe to warm up. The water is always much warmer than the air. So bathing in a, in a, in a pool like this, it's probably the water 35 degrees, while the air might be 10. So yeah, we love to go bathing and swimming in hot springs and geothermal spas. And this is what you can do almost in every little village in our country. Of course, the Blue Lagoon is the most famous one, and I'll tell you more about it later on. Then when we talk about culture, the main thing will be our farms and horses, the geothermal greenhouses. But for other people, it might simply be Game of Thrones or other Hollywood, Bollywood films. It is not difficult to see the Game of Thrones film locations because these are mostly the same sites that tourists visit. So it's kind of left to right of the main road. But I'll tell you more about it later on too. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the hotels, just quickly. It's, it's hotels in Iceland tend to be small, so an average size is uh, 50 rooms. Again, when you think after COVID and you don't want to go to a big hotel, Iceland is easy because most hotels are anyway small. It's all about location, location, location. And in general, four star would be the highest rating in our country. And those four star hotels are all or mostly located in Reykjavik. Now it's very important when you plan a trip to Iceland, don't fix it yourself on the hotels because you're not coming to Iceland because of a hotel. You come to Iceland because of our country, the nature, the scenery, the landscape and the outdoor activities. It's all about the journey you do. So in general, people move from from one location to the next one. So it's important what you see and what you do when you check out in the morning at nine o'clock and you check in in the evening, maybe at six o'clock. It's all what you see and do. It's about the journey. Once you get to the hotel, all you need is really a clean room, a comfortable bed, a hot shower, a national geographic view out of your window, a good dinner, a good breakfast, and on you go with your journey to the other location. So that's what this is all about. But we do have one five-star hotel, actually. It's the Blue Lagoon Retreat Hotel, but it's very costly, about, oh, let's say, roughly 1,400 euro a night. So that's usually not in the budget of most people, but yeah, we do have one five-star hotel.
And it's located in the edge of Iceland, so near to the airport. So usually people only use it for first or last night, um, the arrival day or departure day. Food, and I know that's a very popular subject for Singaporeans. Now, we are an island in the mid-Atlantic, so automatically we become paradise for fish and seafood. And we are really fish and seafood heaven. It can get more fresh. It cannot get more choices than that. You might remember we have the double amount of sheep than people, so lamb will be our main meat. We also have dairy products, and of course, even in Iceland, you get vegetarian meals. But just imagine we don't really grow fruits and vegetables in our country, so very few at least, so we have to import it. So it's a little bit expensive and probably very bland. Icelandic people don't use really spices, we use herbs. So it's not as spicy as you probably used to it in Singapore. But Icelandic food and generally Scandinavian food has become so good because we really use natural ingredients and make interesting combinations and fusions out of it. Shopping, I guess Singapore is shopping paradise. So you probably don't come to Iceland for shopping, but if you like to buy souvenirs, we have a few nice things that you could buy, which are typical for Iceland, like Lava Rock jewelry, the Blue Lagoon beauty products, a lot of beautiful books and calendars. Because Iceland is such a photogenic destination, it's really hard to take a, diff uh, a ugly picture. So it's a lot of beautiful photo books. Yeah, the main product of people, uh, what people find in Iceland would be woolen products. So they're probably not very handy for Singaporeans because it's very seldom you will be able to, to wear a woolen sweater, gloves and, and hats and, and scarves in your country. But that's one of the main products. And of course, maybe food products. If you have a fast flight back home, like if you, for example, buy salmon or herring or other kind of fish. Now let's take a journey around Iceland together. Travel the 2,000 kilometers, which is eight days or longer around the country on road number one. Actually, we don't have a road number two, three, four. It's only road number one, which is the main road around the country. It's not a highway. It is only to, you know, to one lane on each side. So it's our main road going around the country. Other roads are even much, much smaller. Every tour will always start and end in Reykjavik, the capital city. 65% of our population live there. So if you require shopping, nightlife, entertainment, yes, that will only be in Reykjavik because 65% of the population live there. But you can even do whale watching and puffin watching. You can see the midnight sun out of Reykjavik. It's the world's, world's northernmost capital city. It's located on a peninsula surrounded on three sides by ocean. One of the maybe most interesting parts of coming to Reykjavik is that you only need about 15 minutes to drive from the city out into nature. And you get to places where you truly believe that you are the first person ever, that nobody, nobody has been there before. That's it's really a unique thing about Reykjavik. It's really surrounded by dramatic nature. So let's have a look at a few pictures. And on each picture, we'll see a map in, in the corner. And on the map should be a green ring showing you the location of the picture, meaning that most of the locations that I showed to you will be located on the main road, on road number one. So you see, you really don't have to make a big detour out of the main road. So we start with Reykjavik. This is the city center. There you see the gray building, which is the parliament. And on the left side is actually the city hall. It takes like two minutes from parliament to city hall. Here is a bird view of the city center. As you can see, it's very colorful. There's no high rise buildings. It's very walkable. In, in Reykjavik, you don't need to have really any transport when you're in the city center. You can walk everything and there's basically no traffic. So it's a very colorful city surrounded on three sides by ocean. When you get to the harbor, you can, for example, get the midnight sun. 
which is in the summertime. So main time of midnight sun is really from beginning of June to kind of end of July. Then let's travel now together west. So we start with Kvalfjordur, which is one of the many fjords we have in Iceland. Now, a fjord is when the ocean goes inland. It looks like a lake, but actually it is ocean surrounded on the sides with steep mountains. And of course, on the bottom usually are fishing villages. Then we travel a little bit more north, travel through a big lava field. We have volcano crater, we have volcanic mountains. This is just one of many pictures how Iceland could look like when we talk about volcanic Iceland. Then uh, in the west, we have one of the most photographed mountains in Iceland called Kirkjufell, or means actually the church mountain. Many Singaporeans want to, to see that because if they follow Iceland on Instagram, that mountain pops up everywhere. So everyone wants to come to Kirkjufell and shoot a better photo than there is already on Instagram. So it's the church mountain. Then we reach Akureyri in North Iceland. It's the capital of North Iceland. It's the second biggest city of Iceland with 17,000 people. I repeat, Iceland's second biggest city has only 17,000 people. It's located on Iceland's longest fjord. So here, for example, you can go to a botanical garden. Yes, we do have actually two botanical gardens. We are not trying to compete you to your amazing botanical garden in Singapore. But nevertheless, we do have two botanical gardens in our country. You can go whale watching in this fjord. And of course, it's the main um, area to overnight when you travel around Iceland in the north. Then we continue to northeast and see one of those 10,000 waterfalls. So it's Godafoss, the waterfall of the gods. So one of the more bigger waterfalls that we have in our country. Then we reach Lake Mivatten. Lake Mivatten is the biggest lake in Iceland. It is a paradise for bird watchers meaning if you like birds, it has about 50 species on ducks of, of ducks in the same place, and it has a lot of other birds. But if you love geology, it is paradise. It has any kind of volcanic crater you can imagine. So here on the picture, we actually see pseudo craters. And when you look on the bottom left, you see the road. That's where the, the cars or the buses will stop. And you see how the short walk you have to do to see those volcanic craters. This is another crater. It's an ash crater. It looks like a giant football stadium. Again, we can actually drive to the bottom of that crater and walk 15 minutes up to the rim of the crater. If you have more time and more energy, you can, of course, really circle the crater, but you just can go down again. Again, it's a very little effort to go up on that unique ash crater. Then we have an explosion crater filled with water. Again, it looks like really far away, somewhere remote, but it's basically on the main road and it takes you from the vehicle to that place where the picture was taken roughly two minutes. So sometimes people really ask, how active do I have to be when I come to Iceland? How much do I have to walk coming to Iceland? Now, I tell you, you will walk much more in a shopping center in Singapore than on a one-week tour in Iceland, except, of course, you book a hiking tour. Look on the next picture. This is a hot spring, are hot springs in, in North Iceland. You can see where the cars are parked. So if you're kind of lazy, you can just go to the, to the terrace, smell and see the hot springs. But we stop here anyway, 30 to 45 minutes. Why don't we walk around and really have a better look and smell a bit deep, more deeply these different hot springs. So you have here the gases and you have the, the mud pools. So you have all kinds of, uh, of hot springs in this area here. But you have another hot spring where we used to bathe. We have the Miva, the nature bath. You maybe can call it the kind of blue lagoon of the north, but it's different. The blue lagoon in the south is salt water. 
while the Miwa, the nature bath, is spring water. It's one of the most soft waters in the world. It's like feels like silk. It's amazing. Again, here you see people are not swimming. They are bathing. They're warming up. The water is 35 degrees or maybe even warmer. So here we go to warm up in a volcanic surrounding. It's the Miwa, the nature bath. And when we visit a bath like this, of course, a towel is always included. So you don't have to bring a towel along. Not far away, but still a little bit off the main road is Europe's most powerful waterfall. So it's not the biggest waterfall, but the most powerful waterfall in regards of the amount of water going over the fall. It's called Detifos. Then we can travel east and we get to the East Fjords. So it's the fjords in the east. If from there, if you would travel over the ocean, you will get to Norway. It's about a two and a half hours flight between East Iceland and Norway. Now, you can see this picture was taken in summer. So we have the lupine flowers and the ocean there is blue, or it's actually the fjord is blue. Also, these mountains are very popular for photographers. So it's the Westerhorn in East Iceland. Then finally, we get what we maybe can call Iceland. It's where we have Europe's largest glacier. It is bigger than all other glaciers of Europe combined. Only Greenland and Antarctica have more ice than Vatnajökull Glacier. Here we have different ice lagoons with floating icebergs. There's also seals swimming in the lagoon. In summertime, we can actually do boat trips between the floating icebergs. Again, everybody can do that. In the wintertime, these lagoons, they freeze, so then we cannot do any boat trip. Just across the road, we get to the Diamond Beach. Now, what happens is that the icebergs from the ice lagoon, they float through a small river into the ocean. The ocean waves bring the icebergs back, crush them in thousand pieces, and those little icebergs um, sparkle like diamonds in the sun on top of the black lava sand. So this is another Instagram location. So for people from in Singapore and especially the photographers, they want to come here. And it's absolutely no efforts. It's really two minutes from the vehicle to get down to the sand. But don't take those diamonds back home to Singapore because they have no value and they do melt instantly. Not far, or actually the same location, are also those natural ice caves, which you can, which are safe to enter, I say, November to March. And it depends just a little bit on the temperature and the climate, when exactly they open and when exactly they close again. So it's the crystal ice caves, the blue ice caves, which are all located in the same location as the Diamond Beach and the Glacier Lagoon. Then we continue our trip towards South Iceland. And here I just want to show one of many images what Iceland is all about. It's enormous wide open spaces. It's the biggest, this is the biggest lava field of Iceland. It's because it here was happened the biggest volcano eruption on earth. This happens actually in, nine, in 1700 and something. So it's a huge lava field covered by moss and just giving you an idea. And when we stop in a place like this, sometimes people wonder, what do we see? No, you don't see anything except the wide open spaces, but you really have the deep quiet. You listen to the wind. Maybe there's some birds just being on the main road with nobody around. That's the big attraction. Now, when we talk about like attractions and what for is Iceland and for whom, as I told you, Iceland is for people who love nature, scenery, landscape, outdoor activities. But I want also to say for whom it is not right. So if you are a person who really needs Mickey Mouse entertainment, who needs great shopping, luxury hotels and restaurants, endless of nightlife, probably that would not be Iceland since we are a nation of only 360,000 people. But if you want to replace those materialistic values into maybe other values like the deep quiet, the fresh air, the pure water, 
the no crowds, the no pollution, the no traffic jam, the no crime. Maybe that is the Iceland you're looking for. And again, after COVID, maybe many people want to get away from the crowds and be maybe in a location like on this picture. Maybe the only person enjoying these wide open spaces. So now we're getting to the most southern point of Iceland called Vík. In Vík, it's, Vík is famous for the black lava beaches. So we do have a couple of reddish or yellow or white beaches, but most of the beaches in Iceland are actually black because it's of the volcanic ash, it's of the volcanic sand. So our volcano beaches and they are black and that can be very, very long. So this beach here, we can really drive to the beach, we only have to walk like one minute to stand on the black sand. Here's another beach uh, also in the area of week. And again, here you probably need one to two minutes to walk from the parking lot to the black sands of week. Here we would see also uh, puffins in summertime and other seabirds. Then we continue towards Reykjavik. And here we see now a, a couple of different waterfalls. This is Skogafoss. It's one of the higher waterfalls. And in the afternoon, usually when the combination is right, we do see a rainbow. At the same location is the Skogar Folk Museum and Torf Houses. Torf Houses is the old way how the Vikings built their farms and homes. They used torf as uh, the material to building a wall. And that put grass on top of the roof for insulation. So in order to keep themselves warm before we had, of course, geothermal heating. Then we get to a waterfall called Seljelandsfoss. It's one of the waterfalls where you actually can walk behind the waterfall. You might get wet, but nevertheless, it's one of the few waterfalls you can walk behind it. This is another Instagram location, and I guess on every itinerary for people coming from Singapore. Also on this picture, you can see where the cars are parked. So it's a short walk to go come to the waterfall. The next waterfall is probably considered the most beautiful one in Iceland called Gutfoss. Gutfoss is located on the route called the Golden Circle. Golden Circle is the most famous day excursion out of Reykjavik and is always a part of a round trip in Iceland. Gutfoss means the golden waterfall and therefore we call the routing the, the Golden Circle. So it's one of the most beautiful waterfalls in our country. Not far from that location is Geysir or Geyser. It's a spouting hot spring. It spouts up or jumps up basically at 20, 20 to 25 meters, about every four to five minutes. A similar geyser, or geyser you have in New Zealand or you have it in Yellowstone National Park in America. But this one here in Iceland is the most frequent erupting uh, uh, hot spring. So about every four to five minutes. So again, it's e easy reachable and it, you don't have to wait a long time to take a spectacular photo. About a 45 minutes drive from Geyser is the Thingvedder National Park. This is one of the jewels of Iceland. It has two main values. One of them geologically. It is the place where the North American continental plate drifts apart or separates from the Eurasian continental plate. So you actually on the picture on the left side, you see the rocks of the American continental plate, while on the right side, the mountain stair is already the Eurasian continental plate. And in between is a nowhere's land between two continental plates. And you will see cracks in the middle of the pictures. Of the, of the picture. These are the, the rifts of the two continental plates. You actually can even go snorkeling or diving in the, those rifts. So you can travel between two continental plates. You can snorkel or dive between two continental plates. So geologically spoken, this is a very important place. By the way, this is also one of the main film location of Game of Thrones. You might even recognize it. The other film locations where, for example, Lake Mivatten in North Iceland, the Black Beaches near Vík, the, the Glacier Lagoon, so that's on the Church Mountain. So the pictures I showed you, many of those photos are actually film location of Game of Thrones. Now, the other value of Thingvatri National Park is the history. 
This is the birthplace of democracy. Over a thousand years ago, the Vikings founded democracy in this uh, in at Thingvetter National Park. The reason for that, when they came to Iceland, they didn't want a king ruling them. So they decided to, to start up with a democracy. Probably they didn't really know exactly what it meant at that time. But this means today Iceland is the oldest democracy in the world. And I learned that you have elections tomorrow. So use your democratic rights to elect and elect well. Now we get to the Blue Lagoon. It's near to the airport and the Blue Lagoon is probably the must-see, must-go location. Almost 99% of all visitors go to the Blue Lagoon. The name comes because it has this milky blue color. And the unique thing about the Blue Lagoon is a geothermal bath or hot spring. What's unique about it, the water is salt water. So it's not spring water or rain water, it's salt water. Because the ocean is nearby, so the ocean water filters through the lava fields and gets heated up uh, with the hot magma and creates a mineral called silica. So the people here with the white faces, they are not sick. They only desperately want to look more beautiful and much getting younger. So people put the silica mud into their faces to have this kind of a spa treatment, but don't put it into your hair. It's kind of nasty to get it out again. Now let's talk about Aurora, which I know is one of the main bucket lists for Singaporeans coming to Iceland. The Northern Light you can only see from mid-September to mid of April, because that's the only time when we have proper darkness at night. Remember, in summertime, we have up to 24 hours of daylight. In summertime, we have two months with zero darkness. If you don't have darkness, you will not see a light. So you don't see the aurora in the summertime. So it has to be from mid-September to mid of April. And this is probably what you want to see. And then probably the question comes, when exactly, where exactly, how long exactly do I see the aurora? Can you guarantee it? Now, I would just ask you a simple question back. When exactly, where exactly, and how long exactly can I see the rainbow in Singapore? And probably you cannot really answer it to me that way because you need the two elements of sun and rain at the same time, when this will be, where it will be, how long it will be, no way to predict. And that would be the same with the Northern Lights. Now, one thing is the Northern Lights all look the same wherever it's visible. And it's visible in certain parts of Alaska, Canada, in Southern Greenland, all of Iceland, the northern part of Scandinavia called Lapland, and the northern coast of Siberia. And no one of those countries or areas can claim that their northern light is more beautiful, more frequent, or, or different. It's the same northern light as much as the rainbow in Singapore is pretty much the same rainbow as the one in Iceland or in Alaska or in Siberia. But there's still a few uh, issues about that. First of all, in order to see the aurora, you need three elements. You need dark night, so it needs to be dark. And that is why it is from mid-September to mid of April. Then you need a clear sky, and that's the main thing. You need a clear sky. So if it's raining, when it's cloudy, when it's snowing or foggy, you simply will not see the aurora. So if you cannot see the stars, you will not be able to see the aurora. And then you also need the solar explosions, which actually produce the northern light. Now look at this map again. This area in the world is just not famous for, for good weather. So you will have to expect that it's going to be snowy, raining, cloudy, or foggy. And therefore, simply don't expect that the northern light is guaranteed and that you can see it. Because it might be there almost every single night. But if you can see it, that's another question. Because if it's cloudy, snowing, and raining, then you simply don't see it. Now, we're again asking the question like, 
how often do I see it and where should I go? I usually say when the elements of darkness, clear sky and solar explosion comes together, a realistic chance to see the aurora is two to three times a week. So simply stay one week in a location where there's no sun lights and you're probably going to see it. So the Northern Light is actually has nothing to do with luck or bad luck. It has much more to do with the efforts you take to see it. So maximizing your chances to see it. So the longer you are in a location where there are aurora, the better are your chances. So if you stay up to a week, it's a much better chance to see it than if you come just one or two nights. Anyway, it's also the darker location you go or the further away from light pollution you go, the better are your chances. So if you're downtown Reykjavik, you're probably not going to see it because it's just too much light pollution from the city, from the cars, from the houses. But if you go instead away from the city to a very remote place where it's really dark, 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 yeah, then you have a much better chance. And the longer you stay outside, because the notion light, of course, doesn't come inside, again, better are the chances. If you're ready, if you make efforts, then you increase your chances to see the aurora. And there's a lot of tricks how you can do it in order to really have a better chance to see the aurora. But the main thing, the longer you stay and darker location you go, the better are the chances to see the aurora. And when you ask, how long does it last, the aurora? It's the same, how long does a rainbow last? So it could be from a couple of seconds to a couple of minutes or a couple of hours. They come and go like a rainbow. It might be strong one minute, then it disappeared, it comes weak, and then it becomes strong again. So this is the same with the aurora. So they change the colors, they change the shapes, and they can be weak, they can be strong, they can be super, super active. So they could look like this. They also could look like this, or they could look like this. Sometimes the aurora is so weak, you need a really good photo camera to detect if, you actually, if that is really notion light. And then you wonder, did I really travel that far to see this? Okay, you're kind of disappointed, go back to your hotel or go indoors, and a couple of minutes later, someone screams notion light, and it might look exactly like this. So notion light comes and goes, changes the colors and shapes. When you have a notion light like this, you kind of might get even scared and believe they're coming like a, um, spears down the sky and hitting you. So sometimes people almost run away from the notion light because they become so active. Notion light is kind of like electricity in the sky. And when it's very active, yeah, it can become almost sometimes a little bit scary. Now, it all starts on the sun with a giant explosion. That explosion creates a strong wind. The wind becomes energy, and the energy changes into electricity at the polar regions, which we then see in form of uh, light, the northern lights. Now, still, when you ask, you know, why should I go to Iceland? Wouldn't it be better to go to Finland, or would it be better to go to Canada? There, I have to tell you, don't really focus on the aurora because it's the same aurora in Finland as in Iceland as in Canada. As much as the rainbow in Singapore is the same as the rainbow in Finland or Iceland. The question is actually to you, what do you want to do? What do you want to see at a location where there's northern lights? And how cold do you want to have it? Some people say the colder it is, the better the northern light. No, the cold really has nothing to do with the northern light. But the cold has a lot to do how your day program will be. Now, when you come from Singapore, you have the choice of coming to Iceland with zero degrees temperature in the winter, or go to Norway with minus 10, Finland and Sweden with minus 20, minus 25, or going even to Canada, Alaska, Greenland with up to 50 degrees minus. So I tell you, it makes a huge difference to go to a place with zero degrees or minus 25 or minus 50. So if you are a person who know upfront that you don't are not going to enjoy the cold, you probably give Iceland a more priority because we are the warmest northern light destination in the world. 
But coming back to the question of what you want to do and what you want to see, and if on that list is that you want to sleep in an igloo hotel, that would not be Iceland, that would be Finland. So if you say, I want to see Santa Claus and the Northern Lights, again, that probably would be Finland. If you say, I want to go ice fishing, reindeer sledging, dog sledging, skiing, uh, making a snowman, Yes, you have to go to a place where there is snow in order to do that and where it is cold and, and during a time when actually they have snow. So yeah, if you want winter sport and snow activity, go to one of the cold places like Finland, like Canada and Alaska. But yeah, it's going to be cold, but you get the snow. Remember, zero degrees temperature in Iceland does not guarantee you snow. So Iceland would be not the place if you want to go skiing, dog sledging, reindeer sledging, uh, snowshoe walking, ice fishing. That is just not the place. So you have to go to the other places. But if you say, oh, I would love to go bathe in a place like Blue Lagoon or just bathe in a hot spring. That is only Iceland out of that big list. If you say, I want to go into an ice cave, again, that would be Iceland because we do have the ice caves. So if you want to go whale watching or seeing horses, again, that would be Iceland. So you have to make really a list of what you want to do and see, and that should probably decide which destination to go. But also make sure you choose the right timing for it. So if you say, okay, kind of Finland fulfills all my bucket list with the Northern Lights because Northern Lights are at night. So what are you going to do during the day? If Finland fills up your bucket list, great. But make sure you go into the time that is right for it. So maybe Finland will tell you the best time to see the Northern Light is from uh, December to March. They actually don't mean that's the best time to see the Northern Light, but they mean that's the best time for the day program because you cannot really go to Finland in September and October and do the snowshoe walking, the reindeer sledging and the ice fishing because the lakes will not be frozen then and there's no snow. That is why they say December to March. But in Iceland, your alternative to Northern Light is really the sightseeing. So if you want snow, winter sport and Northern Lights, go to one of those minus temperature destinations. But if you prefer rather nature sightseeing, uh, hot springs, volcanoes, um, and ice caves and glaciers, that would be Iceland. So really what you want to do and see during the day is the main decision makers of which destination to go. Because in the worst case scenario, imagine you go a week to a place and you're really unlucky now. The weather is just not well and uh, you just don't see any aurora. Imagine your day program is not good. That would be really a waste of time and investment. So make sure that you have choose the place with the right day program that you are going to enjoy and have that done well. And probably you're going to be happy whether you see the Northern Lights or not. But if you stay one week, the chances to see the Aurora is probably two to three times a week. As I said before, you probably it's probably there more than just two or three times a week. But if it's there at noon time, you're not going to see it because it's not dark. If it's 11 o'clock at night, perfect. But again, if it's snowing or raining, which you have to expect in, the, this, in places like in the north of, of, of the world, then it means you're also not going to see it. The question is also, what is the time you see it? In Europe, you see the northern light usually between 9 and 12 at night, so it means before midnight, while in North America, you will see it after midnight. So actually, Iceland or Europe has a very, very practical timing. So imagine your program would be from 9 to 5, you do your activities and sightseeing, you check in in a hotel that is in the darkness, you have your dinner, you relax you're on Facebook, and basically for dessert, you go out in the garden, out into the nature, into the darkness, look up in the sky, and hopefully you will see the, the aurora. So the reason to come on an Aurora tour in Iceland would first of all again be the nature scenery landscape, the soft adventures and culture combined. And at night make efforts to see the Aurora. So if you stay away from the city, it's a much better chance than 
if used, uh, 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 yeah, it's a much better chance to see it. Now, if we are, go back to the question, when is the best time to see the Northern Lights in Iceland? My answer will be the, that way come in the beginning of the winter or end of the winter. So mid-September to mid-November, February, March, and mid-April. The reason for that is then you have a good balance between daylight and darkness. Ideally, you want eight hours of daylight because you're going to do day excursions, sightseeing. So you don't want to go sightseeing in the dark, right? Because there's nothing to see then. So you want daylight for your sightseeing, from ideally from nine to five or longer, but you also want the 10 hours of darkness at night for the aurora. And that is the beginning and end of the winter. Remember, Finland would tell you best time for the aurora is December, of, December to March, because that's the best time for day program. In Iceland, the best time for the day program is really when we have eight hours of, dark, uh, of daylight. Now, if you cannot travel during that time and say, I must travel in December and January, just be aware that your daylight might be anywhere from four and a half hours to seven hours during that time. So if you come then, don't plan an itinerary or book a tour that takes nine hours each day when you, your daylight might only be five hours. So it's maybe not good value for money. So if you're able to travel maybe a month before, a month later, you just have more daylight to see that sightseeing that you just booked. And so I finished my presentation and I am ready for questions. I assume that, should I stop sharing? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, our Iceman. <laughs> Thank you for the lovely presentation. Oh, oh my God, I learned so much from you from this past Excellent. one hour. We have a lot yeah, of questions indeed. from our audience too. Plenty of questions. But before we go very to the good. questions, perhaps we look at the poll. Okay, sure. Yeah, Renato, while you are speaking, we actually throw out three questions and get the audience to poll. So now we are Good. going to look at the answers. Okay. The first one is, we ask them to guess the population of Iceland. And then we have a tie. 43% of our audience guessed 360,000. And the same 43% guessed 540,000. So then the second sometimes question smaller is better, right? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's more. <laughs> and then the second question is which season will you visit Iceland? And then we have 56% that says winter. And then the last question will be Northern Lights in Iceland. Anyone? A huge 67% say yes, they want to go to see the Northern Lights in Iceland. Yep, so that's all for the poll. Okay, so from the audience, we have quite a number of questions. I also have a, quite a number of questions for you, for myself. Me too, I also have questions. <laughs> okay, let's start with the questions from our audience first. Mm. The first one is a question by Y8. He's asking whether it's winter driving safe uh, for novice drivers in the tropics. Will you be able to advise? All right. So I assume the question is for self-drive, right? Yes. All right. So uh, my advice is very simple. If you're not used to drive on snow and slippery roads, don't do it. And the thing is, Iceland has the average temperature of zero degrees. It means it could be frost or not frost. So it could be icy or just defrosting. So you never really know how slippery the road is until you break. And since we have all these open spaces, no houses, no trees protecting us from the wind, wind and icy slippery road is a really bad combination. So I tell you, and I have met many Singaporeans who just say, oh, I, I do the self-drive, I can be independent, it's much cheaper. 
the thing is the driver will have no holiday he will be so stressed out and probably most of you will not believe me but it's really the fact the driver is so stressed out he is so occupied to keep the car on the road maybe the passengers don't notice until they open the door and often happens the daylight is short so the driver is so stressed to see go to all those places on his list and plus suddenly it's already darkness so there is actually a lot of accidents in the winter time so self-drive in the summer is no problem you can be like a cowboy on a car it's accident for for four-wheel drive driving so summer four-wheel drive yes it's a an amazing country to do that winter time yeah if you're used to it if you have been living in canada or in switzerland or maybe even certain parts of china or south korea yes but if you're coming a tropical country no experience i really tell you the driver needs good nerves and just don't give up and another thing is because most of the people want to see this the northern lights and they just have a hard time driving in in the winter time and what to see what to do in order to see this aurora so i would say a guided tour is much better option leave that stress leave that you know dealing with wind and weather and ice to a professional driver that's just my recommendation okay great advice you have there um also, my another question by Y is asking whether is the Golden Circle the best way to visit Iceland? The Golden Circle is technically a route of 260 kilometers, including three of the main sites. But the Golden Circle basically is a one-day tour. So if you come for a short time, always have the Golden Circle included. And I would say if you do a round trip, the Golden Circle is always a part of it. So I would say the Blue Lagoon and Golden Circle are the two major attractions everybody's doing. So even if you buy, if you will only come two nights, you probably do the Blue Lagoon and the Golden Circle. But for example, the Golden Circle would not replace all the rest of Iceland, but there's three major um, sites, which means Gizir, they're erupting, spouting hot spring, one of the most beautiful waterfalls. You will have glaciers, uh, uh, view to the glaciers, and you will see Thinkwetter National Park, a game, the Game of Thrones location, uh, and where the history of of the um, the democracy found it was there and the, the tectonic plates okay junman has a question but i think you already answered it during your presentation which is whether we have a chance to catch the northern lights during summer and also whether you have the chance to visit the natural blue ice cave so um Juman, uh, according to renato's presentation you can only see all this uh, the best time to see all this is only in the uh, during winter season in iceland that's correct northern nights mid-september to mid-april then the blue ice cave from november to march and he has a very interesting um question to ask too um which this is regards to hotel bookings because he usually plan his hotel bookings in advance but he's asking if he were to uh, just head to the hotel on the actual day itself, you know, what are the chances uh, of finding a room? Is the chances very low? Because you mentioned that there's limited rooms in each hotel. Okay. The answer is a little bit complicated. Before COVID, definitely you need to book in advance. Now, after COVID, at the moment, no. But uh, uh, in July right now, because all the Icelandic people travel, it's even there are hotels that are fully booked. So after COVID, probably in the beginning not, but in the future, especially when you have specific hotels in mind or you go home really in the high season, you better book in advance. The same was for the Blue Lagoon, actually. Before COVID, if you didn't book the Blue Lagoon in advance, you would not get in. It was always fully booked. And right now, of course, there's just not a lot of international travelers and our population, domestic population, is so small. So yeah, you get into the Blue Lagoon now after COVID. But how long that will be, we don't know. Okay. You have excited Waib a lot. He's uh, <laughs> saying that it's a great presentation and Iceland, here he comes. Thank you. And so Zon uh, is also sharing that it's very hard to take an ugly picture in Iceland, which I agree. Yes, we fully agree. Okay, another question by Jun Man. He's asking, how often does it rain during the summer and winter in Iceland? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, that, actually that's what I forgot to mention. So the one thing about the weather is it's unpredictable. We don't have a dry season, we don't have a rainy season. We kind of have four seasons in one day. So we in Iceland we have two sayings. One is, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. Or there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. So. In Iceland, it's not typical to have three days of sunshine or three days of rain in a row. It is really like it changes almost every five minutes. So that's the typical thing. The reason for that is it's probably one of the windiest place in the world and that the wind is changing the weather all the time. So if we have anything uncomfortable to do in our, our, with our weather, is really the wind. So we even have a word in Icelandic called Glückkaveder, which means window weather. So if you look from inside, outside, it looks really amazing because, you know, it's just a blue sky and looks really peaceful. The moment you open that window or door, you kind of don't want to go outside because we don't have any trees shaking in the wind. So you only know once you open that door how windy it's going to be. So that is really our main thing. So also for that saying how to dress for Iceland, because probably in Singapore, you don't have a lot of warm clothing in your cupboard. So what we say to make it easy dress like an onion meaning dress in layers put on a t-shirt a shirt and uh, whatever sweater or hoodie you have and then a jacket to keep out the wind and i know that you can get very heavy rain in singapore so if you have a jacket who keeps out that heavy rain it's the same jacket you could actually use for a windy day in iceland it's because in iceland we love to have it warm inside. So our buses, uh, our cars, our houses are always overheated. So then we almost sit in a t-shirt inside, but then we just have to put on layers once we go outside. So the moment the wind is gone, you can take off one layer. And once the wind comes back, you put on another layer. That's the way how it works. And one thing about the weather I also wanted to say is, when for the Aurora, because people are also wondering like how to dress, what shoes to bring. So I always say like bring shoes that keep you warm and dry, like Timberland could work for you because probably that you have access, access to that. And if they're a little bit too big, even better, just put on two pair of socks or even three if it fits. Just make sure your, sh your feet are dry and warm. Because as a joke, I always say, once you have cold feet, looking at the Northern Lights, cold feet make you go to toilet. <laughs> and the moment you are on toilet, I promise that's the time when the Northern Light comes. So please have warm feet. <laughs> that's very sound advice. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, another question by Yin. He's asking, how costly is uh, Iceland when you compare it to cities like London or Singapore? Iceland is probably one of the most expensive destinations as a whole trip. Um, now, let's, let's say for food. Iceland is, especially if compared to Singapore, very expensive when it gets to food. When I come to Singapore, I just don't understand how you can get food for, about, what is it, like five Singapore dollar or yeah. sometimes less? less? Yeah. So it, it just makes no sense to me how it can be so inexpensive. Now in Iceland, we have the saying, fine dining, really going to a gourmet restaurant, which is a lot in Iceland, is not more expensive than a good gourmet restaurant in Singapore, in London, Paris, New York. So expensive dining is not more expensive in Iceland and it's top quality. But inexpensive dining is very expensive in Iceland. So we probably have the most expensive pizza, pasta, burgers. So the only inexpensive food we have is hot dog. And the hot dog is out of, made out of lamb meat. Okay. So food-wise, it's probably the most shocking when you come from Singapore. Now, if you come maybe from another, let's say if you come from Norway, it wouldn't really make a huge difference. There are things that are actually inexpensive in Iceland. And one good thing, for example, water. I guess in Singapore, if you just say, okay, I want to drink a lot of water, you always have to buy bottled water. But in Iceland, we can just drink water from the tap and it's absolutely normal to go even to a fine restaurant and say i want this meal but only drink water and you will get top tap water and it's the best drinking water in the world and no one will look 
uh, strangely at you if you don't uh, buy any alcohol or any other drinks because it's just the normal way how we do it in Iceland. But yeah, Iceland is one of the most expensive destinations in the world because we are such a small population in a very far away so we have mm -hmm. to pay a, a, a certain amount just to keep our high infrastructure high living standard we have to pay for that okay that is understandable um Faustina has a question for you she's asking for first time visitors to Iceland would it be okay to explore the place without joining any tours yeah, I would say you can easily do that because, again, it's a safe destination. So you don't have to be afraid of anything as long as you don't go into an erupting volcano. Um, <laughs> so, but of course, it's like anywhere, you know, I mean, I, if you go on a guided tour, you just get much more information about the place. But otherwise, you just look at things, take your pictures. And if that is enough for you or you want to, you, you know, you prepare and read a lot, fine, you can do that. But if you get a local guide anywhere, whether it's now going in Singapore and Iceland makes no difference. And if you get a good guide, he will really make a difference how you experience such a country. But if you're not interested to listen to history and sites, because when you're in Iceland, where there's very few people understanding how this a lava field created? How does a geyser work? What, what, how does a glacier get created? What is about the global warming? How do people survive in this country? How, much, how does it go with paying tax, delivering babies? All these kind of things, the, the, the financial crash in our country that we had mm. in 2008. There's a lot of information uh, that you can get value. And I tell you that usually the guides in a country like Iceland really make the trip. So going a guided tour is definitely a difference. But if you're just a person say, no, I really want to travel everything on myself, do my own things. Yeah, it's not difficult. And it's again, because it's safe and people are always helpful but there might not always be people to ask <laughs> because again sometimes you might travel two hours and you don't see a single person and the sheep don't tell you anything that's true <laughs> that's a very valid point yeah when you need to advise there's nobody to ask and of course, in Singapore, you're also in a safe country and you might be a little bit like less careful than mm. people from when you live in a more dangerous environment. And so, for example, often like single female travelers will ask, and again, Iceland is a very safe, family friendly and women powerful country. So as a, let's say a single female traveler, you will be absolutely safe and it's easy. Okay. Okay, so I think we have answered um, all the questions from the audience so far. I have a question, couple of questions of my own and Cheryl also has. <laughs> so maybe I'll start with mine first. Um, I'm just uh, wondering, because in your presentation, you shared about uh, 21st June being the day with the longest daylight. Is it that specific day every year? or do you you know calculate it based on a yearly basis at sometimes it's actually the 22nd but most of the time it's the 21st so so the 21st of june is the longest day 21st of december is the shortest daylight and basically uh, when you look at december every day before and every day after is a five minutes more daylight so for example there's a big difference between first of december uh, first of january compared to 31st of January, that's a 31 days times five minutes. That's actually two and a half hours. So mm -hmm. I cannot really say January is really bad. The 31st of January is just much better than the 1st of January. So every day further away from the 21st of December has more daylight and the maximum you reach on the 21st. In some years, it's the 22nd. I see. Of, okay. of June, sorry. All right. So if, if that's the case, right, are the shops open for longer duration during summertime versus like the winter season? Actually opposite. We rather want to be in the city and go shopping when it's dark. So mm. it's some shops actually have a summer opening and they kind of 
try to close earlier than in the winter time. So because we try to use the daylight to really do our outdoor activities, so it's not uncommon that you know we only want to work until four or five, go home for early dinner, and then after dinner, usually the brain in Singapore would question you, you know, would tell you now you have to prepare to go to sleep. But in yeah. our in our brain would question us: Do you want to go kayaking? Uh, go for a hike, play golf, or paint the house, or whatever. So if we are just not ready to go to sleep. The body will need much less sleep when you have 24 hours of daylight, while in December, when it's cloudy and doesn't really look like any day has arrived, we kind of like to sleep a little bit more in the winter time. And then do the nightlife and going to museums and going shopping more when the weather is not that good and when it's more darkness. Okay, I see. Interesting. Cheryl, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I wanted to. If we really have to sleep during summer, how would you advise or give us some tips? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you, do you want to sleep when you can ha enjoy a beautiful country? Woman no, it's very simple. Beauty sleep. <laughs> We, of course, have blackout curtains. So mm -hmm. all the good hotels do have blackout curtains. And most Icelanders also use it, but uh, some of them not. But in hotels, you have blackout curtains, so it makes the room really, really dark. So you can sleep. But I again, the body will need much, sleep, much um, less sleep. Mm -hmm. But when you're very active in the summer, and people tend to be more active in the summer because the weather is ripe for it. So if you go for really a uh, whale watching, and then you do a hike, and maybe Maybe then you end up with a hot, warm bath in the Blue Lagoon. You will become, after all the fresh air and hot water, you will become tired. Like you put a baby into a hot bath before sleeping, you can do that with, with yourself. Going into a hot tub and you get starting tired, you get tired and then you sleep well. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good advice. <laughs> Okay, earlier on you mentioned about glacier activities, for example, like the glacier hide. Is it suitable for people who have never experienced to hide on glacier? Are you not going glacier hiking every weekend in Singapore? No, we wish <laughs> <I'm> to. <just kidding. laughs> no, it is actually surprisingly very easy. So you will have to put crampons. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like an iron you put on your shoes, and this is of course included in 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 the price for a hike for a glacier hike. You kind of walk like Charlie Chaplin, if you know yeah. how he walks, <laughs> and 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 uh, you just don't put your feet together. You put them apart, and those crampons are like a. Um, uh, a, a, a wonder tool on your shoes mm -hmm. because you really stick on the ice so it's actually very easy and as a gimmick in general you get an ice um, axe along which you really don't need and maybe a little bit for balance but it's more actually to make your photo much more attractive <laughs> so most people don't really hike a long distance on a glacier it's much more about the experience mm -hmm. of walking on ice and hopefully there's somewhere a crevasse where you can safely look into it that might be like uh, water, water flows where you can drink you know melting water on a glacier so it's more about the experience itself so you really don't walk a lot on the ice but of course there are glacier hikes where you do longer distances and more difficult ones but i would say a glacier hike is really for beginners so you need zero experience good just know. lift your feet and stick them into the ice yeah and it's more for photo photo opportunities right <laughs> yeah yeah right because if you stand the right way you take a picture you can pretend that you walk 10 miles on ice <laughs> but maybe it was only two meters <laughs> and you look like a pro that's more important yeah, just, just look very serious like really <laughs> yeah. a professional viking <laughs> i have one last question everybody who goes to iceland knows they have to visit the blue lagoon so it's going to get very popular even during the summer times or winter time so which next best geothermal spa you will highly recommend to visit i would say that would be the nature bath or in north iceland at lake mivatan so if you do the round trip I we personally recommend you rather do the nature bus at Lake Mivatan as it's not as touristy as the Blue Lagoon. Mm -hmm. So it has more space 
and for example in the winter time sitting in the in the in that nature bath and looking at the ocean light at the same time that's probably as good as iceland can get but if you're not traveling up north i would say the blue lagoon the blue lagoon really never disappoints it's amazing but yeah if you kind of imagine to be alone in a hot spring no that will not be the blue lagoon but it's so unique because it's the only salt water hot spring and it's surrounded in an amazing uh, lava field and you know putting that uh, silica mud into your face <laughs> it's just you cannot do it anywhere else so i mean you can do both and there's a difference between the water the the sights you see and that and how, how many people go there but when you come from singapore also to be honest you will not be shocked at the blue lagoon because you are a lot a, a big population on a small area so the, those 500 or maybe even 1,000 people in the Blue Lagoon, if it gets that many, this is not a lot of people when you come from Singapore. Mm -hmm. But yeah, when you come from a small village in Reykjavik, yeah, it is. In okay. a small village in Iceland, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Okay, okay. we have a few more um, comments coming in. Just uh, probably I will round them up with all these comments first. Um, yeah. Juman is asking how do we contact uh, if he wanted a guided tour. He really loves your presentation and all your honest answers. Thank you. So Juman, um, later on we will be flashing another slide. So that is where you'll be able to find all the tours that Renato conducts uh, on our website. Okay, and Adeline is saying that uh, is sharing that Iceland is definitely one of her holiday <laughs> destinations. And Faustina is saying, no joke, after knowing the Wonder Girls, my travel bucket list is really, really growing. <laughs> okay. uh, and then we have we have Wajib who earlier on actually reminded us, despite Iceland being a very small country, mm -hmm. you have a wonderful, good soccer team. Oh, yeah. oh yes oh yes <laughs> yeah. you know we are, we have such a big ego after our football success and we really believe we are the best small nation in the world and we can teach everyone football you know when i travel to asia and people kind of remember that we have a good soccer team you know, and then it's a lot of things that we don't have in Iceland. At least I can ask the Chinese or the Indians, so where was your soccer team? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not sure. I was told in Singapore you don't really play a lot of soccer, that your national sport is going to the casino. Is that right? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a casino in Iceland. We don't have McDonald's in Iceland, and we don't have Starbucks in Iceland. Uh, okay. But we have a lot of other things that you don't have in Singapore. That's True. right. That's why we should right. be going to Iceland. That's right. Like 10,000 waterfalls, which we don't have it here in Singapore. Mm. Yeah, I was actually amazed when I went to Singapore airport and you have now the, what is it, Terminal 5, the, the waterfall. <laughs> you, oh, right? the jewel. Yeah, the jewel. Yeah, yeah. right. So all the people looking at the waterfalls and like so amazed. Ooh, that should come and see good for us. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we got all the questions uh, covered. Yes, uh, very yeah. inspiring. I think you inspired lots of them, like Sydney, Adeline, to want to go to Iceland. Thank you so Welcome. much for today's session. So uh, everybody, just to round up today's session, once again, where you can find all the trips uh, that we conduct for Iceland, you can go to our website, www.travel-wonder.com. Search for the destination Iceland, and you'll be able to see these three tours. Iceland Country Life, Brand Tour of Iceland, and Northern Lights Exploration on our website. Okay, this Saturday, we are going to the coffee farms of Chiang Rai. So do tune in to our Facebook Live at 3.30 p.m., where our coffee roaster friend, who is based in Chiang Rai, will actually visit a coffee farm and show us the origins of where coffee beans come from. On the 15th of July, Wednesday at 9 p.m., Sharon and I will be online to share about all the coffee that we have brought in from Chiang Rai to share with you all the different taste notes. So tune in if you're a coffee lover. On 23rd of July, Thursday, we will be back on our weeknights with Wonder Girls. This time around, we have Jean from Destination New South Wales who will share with us all the off the beaten tracks uh, adventures that she did when she was in New South Wales, Australia. 
you may reach us at our telephone number plus six five eight seven one four three three two one or our website at www.travel-wonder.com. And thank you tonight for joining us. Thank you, Renato, for your time. Thank you to our audience for staying tuned all the way to the very end. <laughs> we are very happy to have you. And shall we take a photo before we log off? Okay. Okay, smile. One, two, three. Okay, thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, our Iceman, Renato. Yeah, and thank, thank you, you everybody so for staying with us. I give my best regards from Iceland. Happy election day tomorrow. Make a good choice. Use your your democratic rights. <laughs> Stay safe and see you soon in Iceland. See, yeah. you. see you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.